Charles Southern Jr. was a respected English professor and assistant chairman of a local community college in Chicago, Illinois. He was fascinated with spirituality and religions. His mother told of how he studied all sorts of African and Eastern religions. He joined a local sect of conscious development of body, mind and soul and rose to take part in Terry's core group of teachers, battling the evil forces of the Black Lords and routinely visited Terry in Dallas. In 1987, his family found him walking the streets of Chicago, mumbling in an incoherent language to himself and took him to the Michael Reese Hospital to be sectioned, fearing that he was a danger to himself. He stayed in hospital for five days and his mother visited him every day, as did two members of Conscious Development of Body, Mind and Soul. When they came, Charles would ask his mother to leave the room. After his release from hospital, he claimed that he had become disenchanted from Terry's teachings, though he remained active in the group. He had booked a trip to India during his two-week holiday in December 1987, and though his family was concerned with his mental state still, he reassured them that he was now fine and so they carried on as usual, stating that Charles had travelled a lot in his life and with his repeated assurances there was nothing to do except trust his judgement. When they failed to hear from him for two weeks after the date he was scheduled to return from India, his parents drove from Cincinnati to Chicago to visit him and after breaking into his house their worst fears were confirmed. Charles was nowhere to be seen, however, folded inside out atop an African ceremonial stool were his dress hat and coat, a Nigerian tribal symbol for death. They also found his passport with no stamps from Indian customs and a small vial of a drug, curare, a drug used in anaesthesia causing total paralysis. There were also poorly written documents scribbled on notepaper and barely legible. At the top of one was the line, I came under a bad influence and tried to battle it myself. Almost no other words on the page are legible except the name Terry Hoffman. In another scribbled document, they found that Charles had named Terry as the executor of his estate. He remains missing until this day. Don Hoffman, Terry's fourth husband, was found dead in a Marriott hotel room by a maid at 8.30am on the 17th of September 1988. Don had two children from his previous marriage with Alice, whom he had divorced in a flash and married Terry within a day of the papers being filed. After their marriage, he had quit his job as an engineer to work alongside Terry and the couple had worked hard to keep conscious development of body, mind and soul afloat throughout the difficult period of the early 80s. Their eight years of marriage, not a bad run on Don's part considering Terry's track record, was ended abruptly when Don took a lethal concoction of drugs, including Benadryl and ecstasy. On the bedside table was a tape recorder, legal pad, pen and a neat stack of Benadryl capsules. Written on the first paper of the legal pad, he had written, my car is parked in parking place number 136, R. D. Hoffman. He had also left a three-page suicide note that claimed he had an inoperable cancer and that he would rather end his life than suffer chemotherapy. The autopsy report discovered the drugs in his system that had killed him, along with a curious revelation. Don had no sign of cancer. Prior to leaving home for the hotel, Don had recorded three video messages for his family. In them, he told them about his fatal cancer, about how his doctor's names were to remain a secret and it had burnt all of his medical records, though for what reason was not explained. He assured them not to grieve long for him and that death is just a transition from one life to another life. He also told them, you'll help Terry as much as you can. Her heart's kind of weak and any undue stress or pressure on her right now would be really bad. Don's children weren't buying it and were deeply suspicious. They called Terry and secretly taped the conversation. Terry informed them that at the time of his death she had no idea about Don's cancer nor who the doctors were that apparently diagnosed him, though she had spoken to him in his next life and that he was now free from pain. She went on, the whole thing is really crazy. I don't understand it yet. I need to talk to him some more. 
When asked about why there was no disease found during the autopsy, Terry explained that she had recently spoken to Kaltu, another one of her spiritual masters. Kaltu had told her that what Don had was definitely cancer. He said the Black Lords were trying to create an illusion so that the medical examiner wouldn't find any cancer, so they would hurt us all more. She then offered them some land in Colorado and told them that Don had told her from beyond the grave that he didn't want any conflict within the family. On April 19th, 1989, Terry filed Don's will, which of course left everything to Terry. David Goodman was the eldest of three sons. Born in Chicago, he moved with his family to Santa Maria, California. He married Peggy, his high school sweetheart, in 1961, and when they had a son, he dropped out of college to support his family. After raising enough money and his son grew, he went back to college and earned a maths degree and MBA from Berkeley. He had a second son in 1965 and in 1967 began studying a PhD in management science at Yale. Things were going well, but suddenly in 1961, on the 10th anniversary of their wedding, Peggy left David and took their son. He started working at a community college as a professor, however, struggling with the whirlwind events surrounding the breakup of his marriage, David started seeking answers. He joined transcendental meditation classes and attended Hare Krishna meetings and eventually, in 1973, wound up meeting Terry and the conscious development of body, mind and soul. He was quickly drawn in by Terry's abilities and excitedly told his brothers of how Terry could read minds and was training him. By 1978, he was spending $150 per month on Terry's counselling services. In 1978, Terry introduced David to his soulmate, a conscious development member, and presided over their marriage. It was also around the mid to late 70s that David's co-workers noticed David becoming distant at work. In truth, he was tired of academics and on the side had entered into a partnership with John Peavy to develop a stock market trading system. The pair wrote a book titled Hyper Profits, which was published in 1985 and became a bestseller. Despite working in a partnership, David largely kept himself to himself and rarely spoke of his private life. Peavy said of him, I spent more time professionally with him than anyone. I just never really knew the guy personally. He didn't seem to want to get involved with anybody. It was weird. Peavy had not even been aware that during their time working together, David had filed for divorce from his soulmate and remarried a different soulmate, Glenda, in 1984. Once again, they were introduced by Terry and she performed the ceremony. In 1987, he resigned from his professorship, citing no reason. He left all of his books and possessions in his office and never spoke to another member of staff. He just disappeared from the college. Glenda had also cast off her children during the same period, pulling them out of high school and sending them to live with their father and only permitting them to visit for two weeks every summer. By 1988, the couple had cut their family off completely, telling them that they had no choice due to their family's negative energies. On October the 20th, 1989, the couple shot themselves in the head in their home. When police found the bodies one month later, they also found a collection of journals that had documented the years leading up to the couple's suicide and they made disturbing reading. They were full of daily entries written in their own hand but with detailed instructions from masters. They showed how over the space of three years, David and Glenda had turned to the masters to control every aspect of their lives, even as far as getting advice on shopping for soft burnishings from Marcus. They were seeking the highest truth and the highest level of spiritual advancement. The masters suggested to them they needed to give Terry money in order to do this, and after building an extension on their old house, they gifted it to Terry, along with over $110,000 and a new car, in appreciation for all that she has done. They also spoke of white pills that they received from Terry. Through this gifting, however, they had earned a certain level of spiritual advancement. 
Glenda had received a revelation at 5 a.m. one morning that her and David were, in fact, Adam and Eve reincarnated and that they had lived 800,000 previous lives together. They took on new identities and begun calling themselves Jupiter and Venus. In one entry, Glenda wrote, Terry and Marcus took Jupiter and Venus by the hand and led us to a beautiful glittering house in the purple realm. It was to be our house. However, being mere reincarnations of Adam and Eve was still not enough for Glenda and David. The journals explained how they needed to have a 50-50 relationship with God, apparently meaning that 50% of all of their earnings should go to Terry. When they still failed to achieve all they wanted spiritually and had cut off their families, the couple found themselves on a bleak path. David wrote one day, Can't you see that we can't take this anymore? Give us your true energies. Eventually, the journal entries turned to suicide. Glenda wrote how suicide would be a path to success and away from sufferings of the physical world. She wrote to David of how they should look forward to being able to come and go from the physical world at will, just like Terry can. On March the 3rd, 1989, Don Hoffman's children filed a case against Terry Hoffman claiming that she had induced Don to kill himself and seven weeks later contested his will. Their attorney was James Barclow, the same man who contested Sandy's will and during his investigations into Terry, he found a note in her trash. The note read, Here is your bulk order plus the samples. Number one is a new formula that is a bit more complicated to make and will cost 35 cents more per capsule. It should have more amphetamines and a balancer to neutralize bad effects. Number two is the basic E formula without the last step performed in purification to remove all amphetamines. Barclow believed that these drugs had been the tablets that several followers were taking, suggested by Terry as vitamins, and were the capsules found at many of the scenes after the suicides. On October the 22nd, 1991, Terry Hoffman filed for bankruptcy protection, claiming that the publicity of the trials had derailed her businesses. However, she failed to mention several bank accounts that she operated, along with artwork and property, but for the Hoffmans, things were not going well. We had a number of offences we tried to assemble, but bankruptcy fraud is all that's happened so far, and that's not even connected to anything except the property she's got. The prosecutors shared their files with the FBI involved with her bankruptcy claims. However, they were told in no uncertain terms that they didn't want to get involved with aspects outside of the direct case of Hoffman's financial problems. We do not want to get into the hocus pocus, they said. In the end, nothing came of the Hoffman's case against Terry. The prosecutor stated, it just doesn't translate into a grand jury proceeding. It's been an interesting endeavor, but I just never could quite get there. On November the 23rd, 1994, Terry Hoffman was convicted on 10 counts of bankruptcy fraud and sentenced to 16 months imprisonment of which she served less than one year, released in May 1995. After prison, Terry appeared to go dark and there is scant record of her activity for the next six years, until she remarried for the fifth and final time in 2002 to Roger Keenley and changed her name to Terry Lilia Keenley. She remained married to Roger Keenley until her death on October the 31st, 2015. Her website, still available for viewing at heavenandearthphotography.com, explains how she developed a new form of photographic art. Her photos are of clouds, which she sold on her website until her death. In Terry's words, however, they are not merely clouds, but various spiritual beings that have revealed themselves to me. Never one to shy away from how special she was, she lists no less than five areas of expertise, from floral design to seminar leader. Among her long list of honours, awards and publications, she listed all of her conscious development of body, mind and soul literature as a multi-volume study course, whilst her biography was apparently included in the dedication sections of Great Minds of the 21st Century and 
Hall of Fame of Great Women of the 21st Century, two publications for which there are no references. The site talks openly about Terry's fantastic spiritual powers that she has had throughout her life. However, unsurprisingly, there is not one single mention by name of conscious development of body, mind and soul. She appears to have offered low-key classes along the same lines up until her death. The final line of her Dallas obituary read, She gave us the opportunity to experience many different vibratory frequencies so that the next time we are exposed to a being, situation or an energy, we can now attune to it and recognise it slash them because she presented those new vibratory frequencies to us. That has truly been a gift from God. So our leader has left us on the physio-astral but nevertheless still exists on all the other levels. Thank you for all your love, tutelage and care until we meet again. It's safe to say that Terry had a knack of attracting people with short lifespans, especially those with insurance policies or large estates. Those who side with Terry believed that it was simply a hazard of Terry's line of work, becoming involved with people in difficult stages of their lives. Somewhat more credible, however, is the idea that these vulnerabilities are exactly what Terry needed to successfully prey on. Terry's lawyer, Fred Time, said during the legal suit following the deaths of the Goodmans, what's wrong with giving a large gift in return for spiritual guidance? Call up some of the big churches and see if anybody died and left them money. However, Leonard Goodman's words probably speak it best when he diplomatically said, Maybe it was double suicide, but one word from Terry would have stopped it. If my son hadn't been involved with Terry Hoffman, he'd be alive today. So would a lot of other people. Mary Levinson's parents grieved alone until they heard of the legal suit against Terry. They now believe she was involved. Likewise, Charles Southern Jr.'s family have also come to believe that Hoffman was embroiled in their son's disappearance. Moreover, there are still more suspicious incidents. Jill Bounds from Dallas, a somewhat unorthodox therapist heavily involved in all things metaphysical, was a former member of Conscious Development of Body, Mind and Soul and had fringe connections with Terry at the time of her brutal and unsolved murder that is a riddle in its own right. In the end, we are left with so many mysterious cases that are all tied up with Terry and her organisation that it's difficult to know where to even start. With her death in 2015, the only certainty is that all we have are questions. Thanks for listening. Please rate, subscribe and sleep tight. Thanks for listening to the podcast. And uh, if you can, it'd be great if you could leave a rating and review. It really helps with the show's growth and uh, share it around as much as you can if you thought it was good. Should really apologize again for the length of the episode. It, it really was unintended. I originally had Charles Southern Jr.'s disappearance and started reading and started writing, and suddenly it was an hour long episode, which, yeah, I hope it was worth it. I hope, um, I hope there was enough decent information. It has to be said that when I was recording it at first, uh, the first, you know, talking about the Black Lords and the White Brotherhood and the capes for times 15 power, I was laughing quite a lot, but it gets very dark very quick after that. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting case. And Terry is an evil, evil woman. I'm not really sure where I stand legally. Perhaps I should say, if all of these things were true terry was potentially an evil woman that might cover me i don't know anyway thanks for listening i hope you subscribe hope you like it hope you rate hope you review share it around keep listening and i'll see you next week cheers